Before you're seated, uh, before you sit down, I wonder if I could take a moment and tell you that God is going to heal cancer in this room. Impossible physical changes instantaneously are going to happen. I already feel it very, very strongly in this room. I could tell you very honestly that there are diseases that I'm already aware of. And the fire of God is going to come on you. And I'm going to explain my job before you're seated is to remove the barriers between you and your healing so that God will break through and you're going to find your limbs changing, growths that you'll look that are there that are no longer there. None of this is done by Mario Murillo. All of it is done by Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. The power of the next several minutes is going to be based on a truth. There is a truth about the Christian faith. I'm going to make this real quick, and then we're going to be seated. We're going to move on. The Spirit of God's already here in tremendous power. There is one fact of the Christian faith that has been missing and it is the greatest weapon that we have. And it's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 18. And I'm going to say it out loud. There are many movements in the world. There's Islam. There's Buddhism, Confucianism. There's the Church of Oprah. <laughs> but Christianity is the only movement in the history of the world where the founder of the movement attends every meeting. Somebody shout right now. Somebody shout right now. So I'm gonna say it again, he is here. He's here. The cancer healing, miracle working God the Lord Jesus, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. I'm going to put that part out there again. There I am in the midst of them. Now, one more loud applause. Let me make the point. Because he's here, all things are possible. Come on, shout. Shout. You may be seated. Thank you very much. To be back at Victory is very emotional for me. The last time I preached at Victory, you were in the Maybe Center. And it is amazing to see how the legacy of this church has not only been preserved, but it is growing and getting deeper. And uh, Pastor Paul and Ashley are doing an amazing job, and I'd love for you to clap for them right now, aren't they? What an amazing job. I married an amazing woman. I uh, saw her across a room. She was working in a restaurant and I knew she was the one. I said, God, that's the one. I hope she's a Christian. Because if not, I've got follow-up work to do. But not only was she a Christian, she was on fire for God. She came to my table to wait on, I was sitting in her section. And I'll never forget it, how the first thing out of her mouth made my head swell. Then the next thing she said, popped it like a balloon. Pow. 
She said, you're Mario Murillo. I said, yes, I am. Said, uh, you're my favorite preacher. And you have been since I was a little girl. <laughs> well, our ages weren't that far apart. I just started really, really young. But I'd like her to stand and for you to greet my wife, Michelle Murillo. Thank you. How many of you all can read? Raise your hand. I have to tell you that John Wesley, the great preacher, said to 700 of his ministers that he had ordained in this great Methodist revival, he said, never go to a church without books that are valuable for people. And we don't carry merchandise, but we carry these three books that are life changers. The first one I want to mention that I wrote is called Vessels of Fire and Glory. It was a miracle how this one became a bestseller. And it has been quoted and used and referenced all over the world. This is a powerful, powerful book that will turn you into a vessel of fire and glory. This one did something shocking. It's called Do Not Leave Quietly. How many of you believe we ought to make some noise before we go home? How many of you believe it? Well, this book, even though it wasn't written that way, became the fascination of Christian conservatives all over the United States. And this is a handbook on how an everyday person can defeat evil. And you need to read that one. This third one is my newest book. It's called, It's Our Turn Now. And how many of you believe it is our turn now? If you buy this book for $15 and this book for $15, you get this one that is $20 for free. So if you stop back there and I've signed all of them and the commercial is over. Raise your hands a moment. There's mighty power in this room. The most incredible thing you can do right now is to allow God to touch you. The enemy of your next miracle is your past hurts. Whatever disappointments or things that cloud your vision of God, remove them right now. Just tell him you are a good God. You're an awesome God. You're a mighty God. And you are able to do more than I can imagine right now. And I surrender to the moving of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody clap real loud. Let's give the Lord praise right now. I believe that it's important to have a word from the Lord. I don't believe you should ever preach or give a speech or talk to God's people unless you know what God has told you to say to them. I've never believed that you can just make something up. Not in this world, not at this time. So the words you're about to hear from my heart to you are life. I'm going to tell you a story about a young girl. Her name is Bree. She lives in Colorado Springs. She developed a disease that literally caused her body to start cannibalizing itself. It was not just immune disease. It wasn't just digestive disease. It was something that literally had taken over her completely. She was five foot ten, and when this disease ravaged her body, she went down to 95 pounds, lost her motor skills, meant most of the time lived in a wheelchair, and she did not know Jesus when she walked into our tent. 
She came in out of total desperation because she had tried doctors, she had tried everything, and she knew that she was now the walking dead. And by a miracle, Jesus touched her, transformed her in a way that is very difficult to explain. I want to say a second name to you, Stephen Collins. This is a man that literally lived in darkness inside of his house and wouldn't leave for six years because of a spinal rupture in several of his vertebrae he became an addict to every kind of pain medication there was could never leave his house excruciating pain terrified to leave except maybe to get food maybe to just walk to his mailbox and he was hunched over and had pain that made him decide to kill himself one day two of his friends said, won't you come to this tent? And so he thought it was a concert. He said, I can't sit down, so I'll stand outside the tent and listen to the music, and I'll brave and see what happens to me. You know why I'm telling you these stories? Because in an amazing turn of events, Mario Murillo Ministries is going to produce a full-length motion picture that will be in the theaters. And I'm going to play the trailer for this movie for you right now. And let's see how it goes. This thing that's been growing inside of you is dying by the power of God right now. She just started getting weaker and weaker, and, um, and the next thing you know, I mean, she's in bed for years, and it feels like her whole life's passing her by. Like, all dreams stopped. Any capacity to be able to take care of myself stopped. I would crawl to the bathroom sometimes. It was hard to witness her physical condition just decline daily. When I looked at her, I was gripped by what was happening to her. I am on the floor and I'm shrieking. I'm feeling this, this thing as illness, as a substance more real than my skin in that moment. I'm feeling it coming out of my body in waves. The love that came into my body was so strong that the illness couldn't exist there anymore. Like it had to get out. It's a miracle. And God said that I want you to get a tent, and you'll see miracles. I was like, this tent thing, what is this? No, this is not for me, this, this is all fake. No, I'm not doing this. He wasn't living, he was existing. When I first met Steve, he was hunched over in a lot of pain. You know, I, was, I really got hooked on the meds. I did try taking my life with the pills. He just seemed like he was in pain all the time. He walked into the tent and he encountered a miracle that continues to blow all of our minds. In this room, diseases will start to be healed in people's bodies. Next thing I know, I'm shaking. I didn't even realize when I'm standing straight up and down and I didn't have any pain. I looked at everybody in the row like, please somebody tell me what's happening here. Steve is just a whole brand new human being. Like, it was a miracle. One characteristic of the outpouring of the Spirit, or what we call revival, is that it's not the end. It's just the beginning. God is getting His people ready. This afternoon, when I was praying, I fought God over the title of this sermon. The title of this sermon is Healing the Healing Ministry. Because the healing ministry of today needs a healing. It's become about money. It's become about exalting a man or a woman. It's become about mingling new age and Christianity. 
It's become an obsession with single ideas instead of rightly dividing the word of truth. It's become obvious to the whole world that there is a need in the American church, a desperate need. We live today, you're situated today across the street from Oral Roberts University. Man that was told by God to take God's healing power to his generation. But there is a generation now that has never seen it. The stories that you see on the screen in this trailer, let me say this to you. Both Stephen Collins and Bree were not Christians when they were healed. And the most amazing aspect of the film we're making is that doctors will appear in the movie with their patients confirming that healings are real. And if anyone understands what's going on in the cynical cancel culture of the United States, for the medical community at this time to admit that miracles are real is a miracle in itself. I think we ought to give God the glory. But what we need is complete honesty. Look me in the eye. We need honesty. We need to be brutally honest that an entire generation has grown up in the Pentecostal churches never having seen a miracle, never having even been exposed to the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and has never understood the fire of true revival. We've had social media imitations. We've had commercialized uh, promotion of individuals. But the devil doesn't respect any of that. Look me in the eye. The devil doesn't respect a fabricated anointing. Give me a good amen on that one. He does not respond to human audacity. The thing that moves Satan, the thing that removes disease, is the power of the blood of Jesus. Now, folks, we can't be afraid to talk about the blood. I'm going to try that one again. We can't be afraid to talk about the blood. We cannot be afraid to talk about the cross. And someone said, but that offends people. Mario, that, the cross and the blood and repentance and holiness and believing the Bible is the inerrant word of God, that offends people. It does offend people. But you got to ask yourself, what is more important for us to work our lives to avoid offending people or to see the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, cancers removed, and the power of God manifest. Somebody just shout right now, just shout. There are two kinds of sermons. The kind that is patched together by an individual wanting to impress the current generation. Then there are those that go into a private Gethsemane and are emptied of self until they have no opinion whatsoever, until they have no idea what to preach on whatsoever, and they stay there until God has finished his work and gives them something, gives them something to say. And it might at the beginning be offensive, but you know what it's going to do? It's going to take the Gen Z, the 20 year old, and show them the presence and the power of God. And when they get that, their offense won't matter because they will find a God that's real, an anointing that's real, and a conversion that is real. Somebody help me right now. Furthermore, there is no political solution for the United States. 
No man is going to save us at this point because our problem is no longer political. It is supernatural. Our problem is no more left-wing, right-wing, conservative, or liberal. It is a matter that America is in immorality. America is shaking her fist at God. America has crossed the line, deserves to be destroyed. But God has said, no, I won't allow it. I'm gonna roll up my sleeve. I'm gonna raise up a whole nother church, a whole nother generation of preachers who will not be bought, who will not compromise. Come on, somebody help me. Who will not lie, but will preach the Hallelujah. My good friend Bill Johnson was with you. And Bill has been uh, sharing a new book out that is not a new book. It was written in the 30s by Charles S. Price. And it's called The Real Faith. And in The Real Faith, he says this. Let's be honest. Why are some people not healed? Why are some people not healed? I live that prayer. I live that every day. You see, the gentleman you see in front of you, the man that's standing here, I preach in a tent. We have an inordinately high number of non-Christians that come to our meetings. If you come into our tent, you will feel the presence of God. If you walk into our tent, you will suddenly believe that your drug addiction will be a thing of the past and you can't even explain it. You might be sitting and watch that right beside you, on one side of you will be the president of a bank, and on the other side is a homeless person who parked their shopping cart outside and walked in and sat in the front. You never know, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. We're at a point now where the anointing is no longer a luxury. The anointing is not something we can hope for. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit right now. Somebody said amen. <laughs> My job is to stand here and help you. Gentleman up there with heart disease, he's looking right at me and Holy Spirit already told me, you have heart disease. You don't need that surgery if you listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm not against surgery. I'm not against medication. I'm not against doctors. I'm for all of it. But I believe that disease has so overwhelmed America and sickness has so overwhelmed America. I was talking today with Ron McIntosh. He told me, he said, it's amazing how many hospitals there are in Tulsa. And he said, what's really amazing is they're all full. You see what's happened to America because of sin, it has wrecked our health. Because of taking God out of our culture, we have invited neurosis, psychosis, suicidal spirits. We've invited sickness and disease to come in because we told God to get out. So the answer at this point is this. The church must understand that all of us now are soldiers in an army. Not just the pastor, not just the church staff, but everyone that knows God is now the extended healing hands of Jesus Christ. Clap real loud. Do you believe that? Yes, you are. What do we need then? We need tonight for us to recognize our, our condition as a nation. Let's admit it. I'm not going to go into gross detail of the sin of the United States. It's not, that's not going to do us any good, and it's going to use up valuable time. Every one of us know 
that our freedom is hanging by a thread. Every one of us know that evil is rampant in the land. Every one of us know that vast amounts of money in the hands of villains is trying to shape America into something horrible and powerless. God in all generations seeks somebody. He's looking over here. He's looking over there. He's looking for someone who, like Oral Roberts, came to the end of himself and decided, I can no longer live just a plain life. I can't look at what's happening to my country and not believe that God wants to do something great. How many of you believe God wants to do something great in the United States? And he will use you. And he'll use you. And he'll use you. If you understand the next thing that I'm going to tell you. There are barriers between you and your healing. We need to get rid of them. You have to understand that my job is to help you to get rid of that barrier between this moment when God wants to heal your body. Many of you that were there two years ago in April when I was in the baby center and we filled it, people arrived at 10 o'clock in the morning for a seven o'clock meeting. It was an overflow. It was an amazing event, but I was frustrated the whole time because the problem was when I stepped into the maybe center, I was intimidated by the history of that building. I mean, to try to pray for the sick in the building that was built by Oral Roberts, I was challenging Betty Crocker to a bake-off and I felt it. And it, it hindered me, even though God was flowing. Tonight I'm back, and it's a whole different story. Now, come on, somebody clap. Real, it's a whole nother day. Because tonight, I'm not going to let the devil have you. I'm not going to let the devil keep you sick. I'm standing here in Tulsa, Oklahoma to announce to the devil, God is going to raise up an army in the United States and they're going to have healing power. I'm not done yet. Somebody get ready. And they are going to prophesy and transform. Glory to God. Anybody feel that? What's wrong with us, I said, Jesus? What is wrong with us? How do I stand in that great historic Victory Christian Center that is known all over the world and people watching right now from many, many parts of the world? Only God knows the size of the audience that I'm speaking to. But I'm going to tell you, I am not just a spirit-filled evangelist. I am an American. And as an American, I am personally offended by what the devil has done to my country. Somebody better clap and shout, let's make some noise right now. What is wrong with us that we can't see miracles? What is wrong with us? I was raised under the ministry of Catherine Kuhlman, under the ministry of Oral Roberts. I watched the historic healings that God did. Little did I ever know that I would begin to see them in our tent. But I'm here to tell you, here's exactly what's going on. Mark chapter 6 tells us the whole truth about what's wrong with us. Listen to what I'm saying. In the name of Jesus, I command all unbelief to leave this room right now. In the name of Jesus, 
I command all fear of healing to leave this room right now. In the name of Jesus, I ask that a presence of God, a depth of God's presence, enter this building to where sovereignly hundreds and hundreds will be automatically healed by the power of God. If you believe that and you desire that, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God. The Lord said, go to Mark chapter 6. I'm going to show you what's, in, what's hindering miracles, what's keeping them back. And you're going to heal the healing ministry. I am sick to death of false prophets. I'm sick to death of heretical teachers. I'm sick to death of people that believe that they can be immoral and still serve God. I'm sick to death of people that don't believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. But I'm mostly sick to death that we who know God are not rising up to deal with it in Jesus' name. But it's time to deal with it. It's time to say, devil, you're done messing with our children. You are done. I'm going to keep going here. I'm going to keep going here. I'm going to turn up the heat. Devil, you are done turning our kids on to perversion, turning them on to drugs, turning them away from the truth. We're not going to have our children stolen. We're not going to have our nation disfigured. We are going to be again one nation under God. The Lord said to me, look at Mark chapter 6. I looked at it. Everybody look at me. When I looked at Mark chapter 6, I saw the, be the worst healing service that Jesus ever had in his ministry. He had one bad one, and it was in Mark 6. Mark 6 is a long chapter. A lot happens. There's many stories. There's a storm. There's a feeding of people. There's a demoniac that is delivered. There's all kind of things happen. But you get to the end, and you find that it ends in the greatest healing service that Jesus ever had. In the beginning, it is the worst. In the end, it is the best. And God said to me, son, why do you think that is? What was it about Nazareth that kept the power of God from flowing? What was it about crossing the lake of Gennesaret to the other side that unleashed the greatest demonstration of healing that the world had ever seen to that moment? Why was one bad and one was good? And I'm telling you why we need to find out because you have a loved one that has cancer and they're sitting in this room. Because someone in this room that you know of is battling diseases of the body and the mind. And we need a miracle. We need another church service the way a submarine needs a screen door. We need God to intervene in power. How many of you are ready for that tonight? Raise your hand. Here it comes. Most chilling verse I ever read was uh, Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 5, where it says, and he could do no mighty work there, but he laid hands on a few, and that was it. So I looked in the original language because I'm certain that if Jesus really wanted to, he could have healed. So I knew the word could was probably a bad word to put in that verse. I think would was better until I went into the original language and it literally said that Jesus came up against a force that stopped his miracle power. The religious demon is the strongest demon. It's not the abortion devil. It's not the perversion devil. It's not the devil worship devil. It's not the witchcraft devil. 
The most dangerous demon in the demonology is the religious spirit. Because it's the only one that can go to church. The others can't. It scares them too badly. It's the one that can stand in the presence of God. It's the one that can seduce a generation into having a relationship with God with no power. That is the spirit that was in Nazareth. And what it was, it was over familiarity. In other words, they knew Jesus, the son of Joseph. That's what they called him. That's not who he was. Jesus, the son of Joseph. Jesus, the carpenter. Jesus, the son. And they were offended at him. And here is the things they did that are being done all over Tulsa and all over America. And out of one side of their mouth, preachers are saying, I want to see miracles. Out of the other side of their mouth, they are not willing to get rid of their religious spirit. Did, did I preach anything yet? So, number one, here's what the commentary on Mark 6 says. Every other city that Jesus went to, besides his hometown, had laid the sick out on the edge of town in expectation of his arrival. His hometown was the only one that made no special preparation. Now let me tell you, I like it that we aren't necessarily wearing ties in church anymore. I'm enjoying being able to breathe. For a lot of years I couldn't. And that's not an insult to anyone that wears a suit and tie. But I think that the clothes is never an issue to me. As long as your clothes are clean, God bless you. And if you have, and I'm so thrilled with all of you that from prayer have worn those holes into the knees of your jeans. But I want you to know I'm not against your clothes. But I do believe that reverence needs to come back to the house of God. I'm going to try it again. I believe reverence needs to come back to the house of God. I don't mean, look at me, I don't mean legalism. I don't mean rules. I mean reverence. Where you walk into the house of God and you know that you know that you're in the presence of God. Number two, they knew him so well that they didn't know him at all. So they knew Jesus, and there comes with too many Americans where you don't see it in other nations of the world. Even the way they say the name of Jesus versus the way we say it. For them, church, they will walk for days to get to church. They will go through amazing things Am I preaching yet, by the way? Is anybody getting anything out of it? So, reverence and the fear of the Lord needs to come back into Christianity in America. You say, well, Mara, that will offend people. Do I have to go over that again with you? So what if we initially offend them? But what happens when the power of God is unleashed in the house of God because we are reverent because we're worshiping him in spirit and in truth, because we've gotten rid of the religious spirit. Help me, somebody. And then all of a sudden, they get off of alcohol in one step instead of 12. And they're turned off of drugs and delivered and set free. Somebody clap and thank God for miracle. Thank God for miracle. The next thing is they were relatives of Jesus. They weren't worshipers, they were relatives. And so let me explain to you how that works. How many of you have relatives? I was just seeing if anyone was cloned. Today you, you can't be too careful. So now I'm looking at you have relatives. Let me tell you about relatives. Relatives get offended at you for the strangest reasons. Let me define what a relative is. 
David was in a cave, lost everything, and his relatives showed up. Relatives are people that when you have totally run out of money, show up at your house to ask you for money. Relatives know you so well they don't know. They have nicknames for you. Let's say that you win an Olympic gold medal. You go home to your relatives and they say, we don't care what you won, you will always be Bubba to us. <laughs> relatives are offended if you stop habits that they have. Oh, so you think you're better than me, you quit smoking. Yeah, you think you're better than me. You're not wanting to have cancer with the rest of us. Now wave your hand at me if you have relatives. The other breed is worshiper. Now watch me. Jesus comes out of the boat and it says immediately the people recognized him recognized him. Now, here's the interesting. One group knew him, the other group recognized him. What I have watched in meetings where the miracles start to flow is people have a revelation of who Jesus is. And they don't rely on the Jesus upbringing that they've had that has been dead and dormant and compromised and absolutely repetitious. They looked at him and they recognized him. And they didn't know him, they recognized him. That's deeper. One had a familiarity with him, the other had a revelation of him. Now, if you wanna know one day the dirty dozen are all following Jesus, and they're getting familiar, and all of a sudden a Roman centurion appears, and he said, sir, my servant is dying, and he needs a miracle. Would you heal him? And Jesus says, yes, I will come to your house and I will heal him. And the centurion says, no, sir. You see, I'm a military man. And I have people that are under me that have to do what I say. And there are people above me and I have to do what they say. And let me tell you who you are. You're the one who can say it and the sickness will be gone. I'm going to try it again right now. You're the one who can say it, and the sickness will be gone in the name of Jesus. Jesus turns around, deliberately looks at the 12 and said, I have not found faith like this anywhere in Israel, not even within 18 inches of me right now. Why do they walk into my tent who have never known God and are instantaneously healed? I'm going to shout it from the rooftop. Because they are not crippled by a religious spirit. How many of you know we got to get rid of our religious spirit in the name of Jesus? The next verse is verse 54, 55, 56 of Mark chapter 6 are astonishing. It says they recognized him and ran. They recognized him and ran. There's a strange thing about Americans. If you were to listen to a theological seminary in Southern California, Fuller Theological Seminary, they tell you this about church. There are three things you never should do in church. Number one, don't be loud. Don't be loud. God is not deaf. You know what I love about Bartimaeus? I want you to act like Bartimaeus for a moment. The people said, while well, he's blind, shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They said, quiet down, and he got louder. And they told him to quiet down, and he got even louder. So I'm gonna tell this church, you better be quiet right now. I said, you better be quiet. You better, no, no, you're getting too loud. Shout! And 
How many of you got to believe you feel good right now? You know you feel good. Then all of a sudden, they recognized him and they ran and began to carry others. You know, if you go to church long enough, you're going to get recruited for a multi-level marketing company. We got a cookie, we got a water filter, we got this, this gummy bear that will make you lose 50 pounds before breakfast. We got this over here, and if you sign five other people, you're going to be on easy street. I'm not putting any of that down. I am not putting that down. I'm not even making fun of it. What I'm talking about is that's what Christians are excited about. So you go to church, and they're excited about this and excited about that, and they wonder why there's no miracles. Because these people recognized Jesus and got all excited. Then look, they made a connection. Look at me. They made a connection. We have people here that eat healthy food. And they recommend it to others. You know, my wife got all excited about this green drink. And I looked at it and how much it cost me per month for this green drink. So I said, honey, let's just let the pool go bad and scoop it out. <laughs> but whether it's the water filter, the dating site, the something or other, Christians are excited. They get excited over a movie. They go, Man, I saw this, but you got to see this movie. You got to listen to this song. You got to take this vitamin. You got to do this. All of these excitements. Here's what happened to them. They saw Jesus, and the moment they saw the face of Christ, they immediately thought of their child that was crippled, their cousin that was dying. They said, the healer of cancer, the one who destroys the works of the devil. The one who can make the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, is standing here in my neighborhood. I'm gonna go get somebody because I've got to get somebody. One of the greatest, one of the greatest challenges of pastors is to teach their people how to invite their friends to church. That would be instantly erased if the revelation of Jesus got in us of who he is and what he does and what it means when we're together. Now, if you go to a church, you'll find that they always pick these very uh, thin ladies who are pixies to be out in the front with a pencil and a, and a church bulletin Welcome to our church. I want to change all that. I want to change all that. And I want to tell you why I want to change it. We have a belief, according to the seminary in Southern California, that Americans don't like it loud. Church shouldn't be long. And you shouldn't say anything that makes them think they're wrong. Can't do those three things. The problem I'm having with that is that is not America at all. That's not, don't make church scary. Do not make church scary. You know what? My wife and my son love to ride roller coasters. Not me. The scarier the ride, the more they like it. If it's the one, the one I think it was called the Widowmaker, and they, you go up straight up, you see eagles on the way up that are looking at you like, what are you doing here? And I said, that's what I've been asking myself. And then you dive. And the scarier the ride, the longer the line. Americans are like, scare me to death. Now, if the modern church growth movement were to take over the roller coaster design, I'll tell you what happened. 
uh, we've taken out the climb and the dive because we know how much that makes you nervous. And we've put extra Teflon on the wheels so you don't hear that, that disturbing clackety clackety clack as it's going up. Hip hop. I'm standing on a street in Los Angeles and a little compact car comes and the ground starts moving. In Los Angeles, you always have to know when the ground starts moving. And the ground starts moving. Inside of this car is a person with nuclear-powered subwoofers. And there's not even a melody. There's nothing. There's just boom, 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 boom. His hair is blowing straight back. His molecules are being scrambled. And meanwhile, the preacher says, they don't like it loud. And whoever saw a modern rock concert where they stop in the middle and say, is this music too loud for anyone? <laughs> and the last one, listen to this. Men cannot go to a long church service because they will drop off the kids and go back home and watch football. All right, let's go with that for a minute. Buffalo, New York is colder than the North Pole. I was there. I'm telling you, the polar bear in the Buffalo Zoo died of frostbite. A polar bear, not lying to you, this polar bear died in Buffalo. So what do the men of Buffalo do? They go and stand in a football stadium outdoors in winter with a team that has never won a Super Bowl. <laughs> never won, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. And they wear hard hats with coils that put beer in their mouth on both sides of their mouth. And they take off their shirts <laughs> because they've had so much beer that they're standing there going, America's been waiting to see this right here. But not one of them will say that the service was too long. Not one of them will say that the seats were too hard. And none of them will say, well, that coach is arrogant. He didn't even shake hands with me. We're missing the point. We're missing America. We're, we're wondering, how did a preacher that yells the way you do get 5,000 people inside of a tent? because I have recognized who Jesus is. And I am not, help me somebody, I am not allowing what we experts believe America is like to get through to me. I look at that young person, I said, yeah, they have social media, they don't, they're easily triggered, they're a snowflake, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying any of it. They are a heart, they are a soul, they are in need of love, they need power, they need reality. And when the presence of God comes in, there is no Snapchat, there is no TikTok that can overcome the power of God. Somebody needs to shout right now. Yes, somebody said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If only we could come back to being children, just children, excited about Christ, full of expectancy. If we could understand that in that moment, the people on the other side of the lake had it right. And like I said, we do need to become scary again. Church needs to become scary again. And I'll tell you how. I want to get rid of, like I said, I don't want to get rid of, I want to give them a break, the pixies from giving out the pencils and the church bulletins and replace them with men that look like Lurch from the Adams family.
and they hand them a bulletin this way. Are you going in there? <laughs> you know who's in there? You know what could happen to you in there? I told you several minutes ago, it's my job to remove the barriers between you and your healing. Nothing does that faster than to remember that healing is an act of mercy from a God who desperately loves you. So let me ask you a question. Are you ready for something supernatural to happen to you? No, I want to ask, are you ready for something supernatural to happen to you? Raise your hands. Begin praying in the Spirit. Praying out loud. Out loud. In the Holy Spirit. This is the moment that I recognize so often is when the glory of Jesus will come into a building and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the miraculous starts happening. My dear, you're up there, right there. Both hands are up. Five years ago, your body began to be attacked. You're being healed right now, right where you're standing. Put both of your hands in the air. That power is flowing right through your body. Is anyone with this? wonderful person. Is anyone with them? If you're next to them, please stand up. The person beside them, stand up. Yes. Are you ready to be healed in Jesus' name of everything? Of all of it, my friend. All of it. All of it. All seven symptoms are leaving your body. You're being healed from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, your head, neck, shoulders, back, stomach, legs, right, right, am I right? Yes, wave your hand at the people, say, Mara, all seven of these things are in my body and they're being removed right now. I don't know how you all can stay so calm. I'm about to lose it right here. There's a miracle, healing virtue. The power of the Spirit of God has come into this place, but He's requiring of us another step. Put your hand in the air. I want you to forget how many times you've been prayed for. I want you to forget how many times you've been disappointed. Those past experiences are irrelevant. What I want you to do is to say, Holy Spirit, come upon me now. Say it. Holy Spirit, come upon me now. Overshadow me now and begin to heal my body and set me free in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. My brother, in the, yes, in the white shirt, you're being healed right now, right there. That's the power of the Holy Spirit on you. Your heart, your blood is being healed in Jesus' mighty name right now. Wave your hand at the Lord. Receive your miracle. What's going on? What's going on?
There's a gentleman right down here, ringing in the ear, had a stroke, has problems in the lungs and in the heart. You're right down in this area and you're being healed in Jesus' name. And I want you to receive that miracle and don't doubt it, not for a moment. Now, I'm moving right over here. I want everyone to pray in the Spirit just for a moment, just for a moment. Pray out loud in the Holy Spirit. All unbelief, all doubt, all fear. If you know that man, lay your hand on him and watch the miracle power of the Spirit of God go through him. Sir, right here, white hair, both hands are up. Stand up. Do you know that you're being healed in your blood, in your heart, your legs? Do you realize that you have difficulty with balance? because you actually broke a joint, but now you're being healed by the power of God. And I want you to do me a favor. Move your arms like this. Move your arms like this. Now I'm gonna tell you what Peter said to the man at the gate, beautiful. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Begin to walk, sir. Begin to walk. Begin to walk. Yes, take off. Take off. Find him away. He needs a he needs a walking lane right now. And there he goes. All the effects of a stroke, heart disease, it's all being healed. Turn around. You have twice as much strength as that. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Everybody get up on your feet for a moment in the name of Jesus. Why would you disobey the Holy Spirit? Why would you disobey the Holy Spirit? In this center section right here, there are five of you that have migraine headaches continually and they're all going to go. And I want all five of you to raise your hands right now in the name of Jesus. One, two, three. Come on. Now, four. One more. Yes, five. Somebody give God the glory. Put your hand on your forehead, all five of you. Put your hand on your forehead. Yes, yes, yes. It's moving over here. The power of God is moving over here. In the name of Jesus. Oh, I need this, Lord. I need this. I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Help me. Agree with me in prayer. I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I bind every disease that you have brought on people. And you are bound and you are broken in the mighty name of Jesus. Is it possible to leave this stage? I... Thank you, brother. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to listen to me. Sir, put your hand on the side of your head. You're being healed in the name of Jesus. It's both ears. Both ears are being healed in Jesus' name. Now, put your hand on his spine. His spine is being healed. His eyes are being healed. His legs are being healed. I'm going to tell you there's power in this place. Look, look at me right now. You are being healed in Jesus' name. It is an absolute supernatural miracle by the power of God. Now, here's how you're going to receive your miracle. You're going to lay hands on her. I want you to stand up. I want you to listen to me. For over a decade, you've been in a spiritual battle. 
and it's over tonight. It ends right here, right now. And God is healing your nerves. He's healing your stomach. He's healing your legs. You're being healed in the name of Jesus. Put your hand on your forehead. That's exactly right. Everybody better sit down. Better sit down. Pray in the Spirit right now. I doubt very seriously that there are five times in my life where I have felt the power of God this strong. I want everyone in this section, this section to listen to me. Heart disease, diabetes. Heart disease, diabetes is being healed. And I'm gonna tell you where it begins. It begins in this section. I want everyone with heart disease and diabetes to stand on your feet. That's in this section right here. God told me he had you all sit together. There's two more. There's one more. I'll get you. I'll find you. Thank you. Put your hand on your heart. Here's what I want you to do. According to John chapter 4, it says the man believed what Jesus said. I didn't tell you you were healed. Jesus Christ is healing you. Now, sir, one more addition for you. Your legs and your feet are being healed. Now, everybody listen. This man has suffered a hellish pain in his legs, in his lower spine, in his feet that is unbelievable. It's almost to the level of Stephen Collins. His spine is being healed right now. His feet are being healed. And all of the neuropathy is leaving his body. You better watch out. It's not getting any, any easier. It's getting mighty. You better move around, brother. My brother, you can move around. You don't have that ankle pain anymore. You don't have any pain. Somebody give God the glory. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. I need somebody next to me. Not, not because I'm afraid of anybody, but I might fall over. You better be seated here. I'm telling you, this is, this is it, brother. This is it. I need you to help me. Put your hand on this woman. There's a woman of God right here. She's being healed. She's being healed. You're being healed. Now, I want all of you to listen to me. There are three women, three women in this section that have mysterious... I'm, I'm even going to stop. Stand up. I'm telling you, you listen to me and you listen to me carefully. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the devil. You have a dream, and that dream is threatened by this physical ailment. There's something you want to do. You believe God has called you to do it. You cannot do it so long as you have this illness. And you have five separate parts of your body that are being healed by the power of God. The head, the neck, the back, the stomach, the legs. Somebody better give God the glory. Give God the glory. Don't glorify a man. Glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Remain standing, my dear. Put your hand on your stomach. Two other women in this section have a disease in your intestines, your digestion. And they're sitting right next to each other. Some, listen, I don't know how you can stay so calm. I'm like, somebody give God the glory. Give God the glory. Let your faith arrive. I'm going to 
tell you the truth, my dear. Put your hand on your stomach. This is the last time you will have that attack. And this attack is all encompassing. It not only is in your stomach, but it affects your entire body when it attacks you. Now I want you to help me because you're healed. Lay your hand on her and look at me, dear. You receive all of this. Receive all of it. Put your hand on your stomach. Now, that young lady who's praying for you, gently put your hand on her forehead. Pray for this woman you're praying for. Put your hand on her forehead. I tell you, she's in the spirit right now. There you go. Put your hand on her forehead. Man, I'm glad we got that worked out. Now, thank you, dear. Stomach, head is being healed in the name of Jesus. This is it. This is it. You're, you know, you're afraid that if you give in to this, something really emotional is going to come out of you, and you're absolutely right. And it's the power of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You start speaking, speaking right now. You're being healed in Jesus' name. There she goes. Out loud, out loud for his glory. You see this row right here, this row starting with his beautiful smile in the yellow. There's healing flowing in that aisle. Now I want to tell you what's going on in this section. God is healing inflammation of the joints and spinal curvature and back pain. Now, stand up if that's you. Shoulders, neck, There are two more. There are two more. Where are the other two? There's one, two next to each other. Would you help me stand? Yes. Can I talk to you for a second? Yes. Stand right where you are. This is the end of a broken heart. This is the end. And it literally is not just an emotional, it is a physical. Your heart and your emotions are being healed because this pain in your joints has been totally discouraging. But you are being healed right now in your spirit. All of you that are here, put your hand over your heart. Put your hand over your heart. One more word, and then I'm going to be with you right there. Are you looking at me, dear? You know, I'm, ta- I'm talking to her. That's right. You have your right hand over your chest, right there. Accident, collision, damage to your joints. Never healed after that car wreck. Never healed. But it's healing right now. Are you ready? All of you here? Put your hands in the air now. Said, this is the end of my pain. This is the end of my sickness. This is the beginning of my miracle. And it's finished. Just as Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Let the house of God clap and give him all the praise.
I bind cancer in the name of Jesus. I bind cancer in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, God, that cancer in this house is going to be attacked by the power of the Holy Spirit. Everyone in the house of God battling cancer, stand to your feet right now. You're battling cancer, stand to your feet. I'll know when I've reached the right number. Not everyone is standing. Stand right now. Stand right now. I wonder if sometimes we don't realize the implications of things we ask God for. For the first time in my ministry, I am convinced that the reports of this night are gonna go through the medical community in Tulsa. I'm convinced of it. Now, when do you explain to your doctor what happened to your chest? When do you explain to your doctor what happened in your head? You don't mention my name because I don't matter. You say Jesus of Nazareth did for me what he did when he was on the earth and he healed my body. How many of you believe that God is going to wipe out cancer in this room? Right now? How many of you believe it? Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, for the glory of God, I thank you that healing virtue is flowing in this room. And every cancer, every malignant tumor is going to be healed in the name of Jesus. I thank you that it is happening right now. Right now. absolute moment I didn't even realize until I walked over here and I saw Tom who this is and I've been praying for months since I was in Hendersonville with you Tom I've been praying for this moment for months fire of God fire of God fire of God <laughs> fire of God I want to tell you all, and I, I'm going to permit them to be seated. I want the rest of you that we have just prayed for you for cancer, you may be seated. But I want everyone to close your eyes and I want you to understand something. When the devil can't attack us, he attacks people we love around us. And if we're on a mission for God, and we're creative and influential. We need to double up in our prayer for the family around us and build a hedge because the enemy wants them. And oftentimes, the purpose of the attack is to prevent the next level of your success. You're about to do something the devil cannot tolerate, cannot deal with. It's so threatening that he has to pull out all the stops. And so right now, I'm not only releasing sickness out of this room by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm also asking every visionary in this room to determine to do two things. I am going to amplify my intercession for my own family and the people around me. And I'm going to tell the devil tonight, you cannot touch my wife. You cannot touch my husband. You cannot touch my children. Somebody help me pray that prayer right now. You will not touch the people I love. Are you praying it? Are you asking God that? Now look at me. 
Everybody shout to the Lord. Clap your hands. Shout to the Lord. Let me open my heart very quickly. There are inventors, entrepreneurs, medical professionals and geniuses sitting in this room. And you're sitting on top of something that can help humanity. And the devil wants to diminish, insult, and discredit your gift. In fact, the Lord's even told me that many of you in this room have been given from God a vision that is not even in your profession. And you haven't even told the people near you what God has told you to do. You're currently involved in something creative, but it's nowhere near what you're about to do for God. Now I want everybody to look at me. I'm going to do one thing one thing now, I don't want anyone to leave. Now, if you have a bathroom emergency, in Jesus' name, there's no way I want to hold you back. But I want all of you to listen with all the attentiveness that you can. Do you know the number one mistake that preachers in the healing ministry make at a moment like right now? Is they don't explain to the people something very, very important. Did God pick these people out? Tell me what was wrong with them because they are more loved than you are or more special than you are. Do you know that God healed them for your sake? See, right up here, right there, is a young girl that's battling multiple diseases in her body. She's about to be healed. She's going to be another one of those testimonies of the power of God. Over here and over here, right all the way up there. And what we're going to do is lay hands on one another. Because you see, if the memory of tonight that is left in our hands is this, Mario was used by God mightily, then we failed. To leave it as the bottom line of this occasion would be an abject failure. Here is what it must be. I too operate in the Holy Spirit and Mario has emboldened me to go to my next level of faith so that I will be used of God to heal the sick. How many of you understand what I've just said right now? Now, here we go. Wherever you are, if you are sick in your body and you need a healing, Please, if you've already been healed, don't raise your hand. No double dipping. If you have sickness in your body and you need to be healed, raise your hand right now. Do you see someone beside you with an upraised hand? Touch them on the shoulder. And if both of you have your hands up, you're going to need to touch someone on the shoulder even though they're touching you on the shoulder. Now, I want to augment the pre-existing Victory Christian Center declaration. I want to augment it a little bit. And here's what we're going to say. I am a weapon in the hand of God it is my destiny to see signs and wonders. It is a part 
of my inheritance to have the prayer of faith which I am now praying over you and in the name of Jesus I command your illness your sickness to leave your body all of it according to the cross cross of Jesus by his stripes you were healed by his stripes you were healed and it is manifested while I'm praying over you right now now seal it with heavenly language seal it out loud with heavenly language Oh, there's so much encouragement in his house. There's so much power. There's so much anointing. One of the signs that you are healed, someone in this room knows that they are healed because they're not exhausted like they normally are. That's a sign to you. Something has happened. Others of you, pain is left. Miracles are going on right now. Now. Yes, now. Now. And all of it, we give Jesus the praise and the glory. All of it. All of it. How many of you would like to inflict profound pain on the devil right now? Right now, right now, would you? I'm sure he wasn't thrilled to hear that right there. And here's how we do it. Psalm 40, verse 10. I have not withheld your mighty acts from the great congregation. If you were healed tonight, you have an obligation to give God the glory. I have not withheld your mighty acts from the great congregation. If you were healed by the power of God tonight, stand right now, give God the glory. seated all night I've been looking at a select group of people who have the most beautiful look on their face that I ever see in a meeting it is the I was kidnapped and dragged here by my friend look And the amazing part is that you did not leave because I'm sure that you saw some things tonight that could tend to scramble your molecules. But in a moment, I'm gonna ask everyone in this house to bow your heads. Not yet, because I want to look you right in the eye. The experts say don't ever make people raise their hand. That's embarrassing. Don't ever make people stand up. That's even worse. And by all means, if you have them stand and raise their hand, do not make them walk to the front. Don't do those things because it makes people nervous. And so to help you with your nervousness, I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna do all three of those things. And so now you can relax. You can relax.
Today, I was thinking about America and what people are going through. Housewives, husbands, children, everyday people that, that aren't glamorous in the eyes of the world, but daily are trying to get through it. And for them, a good day is a day that they didn't give up. And we don't want to talk about what a bad day is. But the atheists in London got together and raised a bunch of money to buy all of the advertising on the side of the double-decker buses that they could find. And you know what their billboard said? There probably is no God. Go ahead and enjoy your life. Tell the children who are being forcibly pulled over the border into hellish circumstances, most of them being molested in the journey, tell them to go ahead and enjoy their life. Picture a special needs child and the mom who's single, can't afford the medical bills lives day by day in abject terror. Take another mom in the inner city where one of the Christmas presents that was most popular in parts of New York City was bulletproof vests for children. Try to picture a mom putting that on her child, sending them off to school and living with the imagination of what might happen to that child. Tell them to go ahead and enjoy their life. And so all you atheists need to hear from me personally. Here's what you're really saying. No help is on the way. No help is coming. Nobody's gonna rescue you. Nobody's gonna take that weight off of you. Nobody is going to turn your life around and plant you in a family to protect you. It's not coming. There's no help on the way. Oh, the government is trying to be God, but what a horrible job they're doing. Here is what I'm telling you. Help is waiting for you. Right now. Listen. Help. The kind of help that you can't even put into words. Help that's beyond the help that you think you need. And the Bible says, this poor man cried to the Lord and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all of his troubles. Let me tell you what you have. Trouble, anxiety, loneliness, fear, uncertainty about tomorrow you know there is nothing that one human being can do for another that's better than to introduce them to Christ that is not invading your space that's invading your hell and removing it let me tell you something the best thing the best thing you will ever do is skip the religion altogether and totally surrender. Don't, I don't do this. When I'm in the tent, I never try to sell people on Christ. I warn them, I convince them, but I don't try to sell them on Jesus because I don't want to do any thing that would remove the active ingredient of conversion that you so desperately need. You need to walk out of here with joy. You need to walk out of here with this gift that's in the Bible that is beyond words. It says, my peace I leave you, not as the world gives, I give unto you. And the Bible calls it, Paul said, peace that passes understanding. Meaning, why? in the midst of everything I'm going through, when I see no rational reason to feel hope, why 
Am I stubbornly feeling that everything is going to be okay? That's the peace that passes understanding. And you don't have it. You don't have it. And your life hurts. And every day is getting harder than the one before. But the greatest gift of the faith of Christ that I could give you is this one. In the New Living Translation of Philippians chapter 2, it says God is at work in you to give you two things. Look at me. Two things. And here's the deal. You've had one, but without the other, it doesn't work. And you've had the other. Without the former, it doesn't work. But when they're together, amazing things happen. Habits are broken. Emotions that are destructive, wiped out. It is the way it's said. Philippians chapter 2, the New Living Translation says, it is God who is at work in you to give you both the desire and the power. The desire and the power to do what pleases Him. To stop living the life of failure and disaster and anger and rage and bitterness and addiction. The power and the desire. The desire and the power. All of it. Close your eyes. I'm not going to argue with you how much you need Jesus. I'm not going to argue with you about that. There is no sermon on earth that is more convincing of your need of Jesus than the feelings that you have right now in your soul. That's the most eloquent, irresistible sermon. Something in you is screaming, I need God now. I need him. And I won't leave without him. So what do you want me to do, Mario? I want to unleash the other greatest duo of power. The first I said is desire and the power to do what pleases God. This one is, if any two of you shall agree is touching anything on earth, it will be done. Maybe the devil has convinced you that God doesn't hear your prayers or your prayers don't have power. But you and I are going to agree in prayer. What you're going to do is, in a moment, you're going to put your hand in the air and say, man of God, pray with me that Jesus will become the undisputed Lord of my existence. And all my sins will be washed away and I will become a new creation. If you're going to let me pray for you to do that, put your hand in the air right now. And without hesitation, stand to your feet if your hand is in the air. I'm going to ask Pastor Paul if he would come to the stage. I'm asking all of you that are standing there, get out of your seat, walk to the front right now. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Fill in the front. It's all right. Well, I, I would think that you would shout a little bit louder than that right now. This is Fill in right back here across this side right now. Once again, folks, what do you think of what your eyes are seeing right now? Can you give him the praise, Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ. Let them, let them help you with this situation right here in front. Now, everyone listen to me right now. Out loud, 
so I can hear you. I want you to believe this prayer. Don't just say it. Believe it. Own every word that I speak right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I see you on the cross dying for me right now. I thank you, Lord, that you died for me. When you died for me, you proved that you loved me. Three days later, you rose from the dead. When you rose from the dead, you proved you had the power to change my life. I give you my life without reservation. Forgive all my sin. Wash them away and make me a new person. Jesus, you are my Savior and my Lord right now. Right now. I thank God for Pastor Paul and the amazing work he's doing. And I'm going to give him this microphone because I want all of you that have come forward to know that if you do not have a church home, I think you just found one. And these people will take care of you. They will take care of you. They'll take care of your children. They'll be a positive force in your life. I want to remind you about the books. Everybody buy them out. I don't want to take any home. But in the name of Jesus, bow your heads, everyone, before Pastor Paul comes. And please, Jesus, we don't have the words to thank you for what you did tonight. But our attention is now fixed on these that have come forward. Everyone in the audience, point your arm toward these people. And in the name of Jesus, for the glory of God, I thank you that they are being set free and every need will be met in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.